Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I know it's a long and tiring day, and I appreciate all of you being here. So yeah, once uh, some more people are coming in, we'll be starting. Okay. Okay. So I'm Hubing, and uh, he's <laughs> sorry. I'm Nilam. He's Hubing. And we are here to present to you Data Highway, which is Yahoo's event transmission platform delivering petabytes of data every day. Um, a little bit about us. Well, I'll keep it short here. Uh, we joined Yahoo pretty much at the same time, and we are in the Data Highway team since it is built from scratch. And we share interest in distributed systems. So uh, here is the agenda. We will start with what is Data Highway. Uh, and why it is needed in Yahoo, and what use cases it solves. Actually, many of these use cases will be quite uh, familiar to you, and you might be actually using those use cases in your companies. Uh, we'll follow it up with a high-level overview of data highway architecture. And finally, Hubing will run through some challenge stories, some of the really interesting challenges that we have faced during the evolution of data highway. So um, to start with, what is data highway? Well, uh, no price for guessing. It's a data transport, right? Uh, we can actually give the analogy of Hyperloop and Waterloop, which are a proposed network of uh, tubes um, for um, high-speed traffic. And data highway is similar network of tubes, but the cargo in this case is data. Uh, actually, we can go over use case uh, to make it uh, more uh, understandable. So let's consider a tenant which has some hosts uh, emitting data in multiple data centers. And the tenant wants to aggregate this data, uh, transmit this data to a separate data center, and probably he wants to process this data using some peak jobs or some, some real-time storm topologies. So for these use cases, he can make use of this so-called tracks or tubes for data highway, and uh, he can have this data transmitted. And we can extend this use case further to consider a second data center where he is having another HDFS destination for business contingency. And Data Highway can take care of replication of this data to the second data center. Also, we could consider a second tenant who might want to make use of this multi-tenant architecture and wants to have his own isolated event stream delivering to HDFS or maybe to a Kafka destination. So Data Highway can take care of all these different use cases. So we can actually replace this uh, stack of tubes that you see here and replace them with a black box called Data Highway, which we'll be going over in the rest of the presentation. So what is Data Highway in terms of data or in terms of metrics? Data Highway is 250 billion inbound events every day. And if you consider data rate, it translates to nearly 800 terabytes of input data on an average. It gets replicated to multiple destinations, which essentially gives us 1.2 petabytes of output data every day. And on peak days, it actually goes up to 1.8 or sometimes even 2 petabytes every day. This comes from nearly 30,000 publisher hosts. And uh, these hosts are actually from 66 tenants that we are currently supporting in our production infrastructure. So that is Data Highway for you. It's a multi-tenant hosted platform that collects, aggregates, and delivers data. So why Data Highway is needed? So what are the specific use cases that essentially make, made Yahoo create Data Highway? So Data Highway, well, if you consider Yahoo, it actually has a huge number of data being generated across data centers, right? So it had a generic use case of aggregation of this data and delivery of this data at a very, very large scale. And uh, it wanted this platform to be multi-tenant so that the resources could be shared. And uh, onboarding of new tenants or new use cases were supposed to be very simple. We can have quick hardware uh, uh, allocation, easy setup, and we can have the economy of scale for management and monitoring. Also, the platform was supposed to be customizable for Yahoo's different requirements and to support Yahoo's in-house technologies for uh, authentication, authorization, monitoring, 
data storage, all these use cases. So that is what gave birth to Data Highway. But the need of Data Highway is not that simple because of the diversified use cases. So this slide actually gives you some real example of four of our largest tenants. As you can see, tenant two here is having an average event size of 38 kilobytes, whereas tenant four is it's 1 KB, right? And in fact, some tenants are as, uh, they have like as small events as 60 bytes. The data rate also varies a lot. It varies from 160 terabyte per tenant to a few gigabytes for some other tenants. And publisher hosts vary from 30,000 hosts, or sorry, 15,000 hosts to uh, probably less than 10 hosts. So Data Highway takes care of all these use cases. And or to this diversified tenant base, what features it provides? So by now, it's pretty evident to you, right? So it does multi-data center event collection and multi-data center event delivery with business contingency. So um, it, de it delivers to HDFS, Storm, and Kafka. And for collection, it also takes care of AWS EC2 instance publication too. The publishing options are very flexible. You can actually emit data directly to Data Highway's web service, or you could make use of the multilingual uh, client API available. You could also use some server plugins, and you can actually emit data to data, data Highway using these plugins without writing a single piece of code. Uh, supporting features, they are actually the real strength of Data Highway, right? So it has an event accounting web service which lets you find out for a specific tenant how many events were omit emitted for a specific time range and how many of those events actually made it to a specific destination. The Data Highway platform is completely rate limited, so one tenant cannot throttle another, but it also has adaptiveness. So suppose one specific tenant is having a spiky traffic, it is going above its allocated capacity, we don't throttle him immediately. Rather, we do it only when we don't have enough capacity available in the same data center. So all these features make Data Highway uh, really uh, flexible. Uh, but on top of that, for streaming endpoints, it has some nice uh, filtering options available. So Data Highway uses uh, Evro to deliver its data, and a tenant can send events of different schema types using the same uh, tr track or uh, his allocation. So he can actually specify which event types or what custom tags he wants to consume in spe each specific destinations. The events could also be partitioned in terms of schema type for HDFS and Kafka. And when you deliver it to HDFS, actually uh, the event could be partitioned in terms of configurable time also. The system is very fault tolerant, so if there is network, network or endpoint failures, we spool the data till the provision capacity is not exhausted, and uh, so we don't lose any data. And finally, we have a schema registry, which allows the customers to push and store um, their Evro schemas, so that at the streaming endpoint, they can use this registry to deserialize their events. Some additional facts here. Data highways, data agnostic, it does not look into any of your events. The maximum event size is one megabyte, which takes care of all our use cases. It takes Evro events, and you can actually wrap any blob event in the Evro event uh, wrapper and send it to Data Highway. The current hardware footprint is, at this point, 500 hosts, and we are actually aggressively reducing it. The SLA is, uh, for batch delivery, it is uh, 15 minutes, but most of them actually mix it in less than five minutes. And for uh, Storm and Kafka, Across geolocations, the max is five seconds, and actually most of them actually makes it through the whole infrastructure in less than a second. So now that we know what use cases it serves, let us look at what uh, makes Data Highway, what is the architecture. So under the hood, we have zero MQ serving uh, as the inter-process communication uh, among the components. Evro is very prominent here because it is the serialization platform serialization protocol throughout the platform. And we make use of live event, curl, HTTP components, and a lot of Yahoo in-house technologies. And Chef, I'm specifically mentioning it because we use it a lot for our CI-CD, configuration push, and uh, hardware management. So how all these technologies together gives us Data Highway? Let us unwrap this uh, black box. Data Highway actually has three different subsystems, routers, gateways, and prisms. Routers is a subsystem 
which actually resides in the publisher's data centers and consumes data from those publisher hosts. It makes multiple copies of the data depending on the configuration and delivers it to the second component, which is Gateway, which is running in the destination data centers. And the Gateway, once it receives this data, batches it into Avro files and delivers it to HDFS. The third component is Prism, which runs in the same data center as Gateways, receives the events from them, and delivers it to Storm and Kafka at real time. So this is a simplified view of it, which we'll be using for the rest of the architecture. Uh, let's start with the tenant first, right? So as I mentioned before, uh, tenant has multiple options of publishing data. The most common use case is the highly performant client API, which is written in Java, C++, Perl, and uh, Python. So you could use any of them, and you can integrate with your code, and actually you can use it to publish events to a very lightweight daemon process that runs in your publisher host. It takes those events, batches them, and sends it to routers. In case of failures, in case of any network issues, both these components can spool this data to the spool files in the same box, so you don't, don't lose data, and your emitting process also doesn't stop. And once the outages are resolved, the daemon can take this data and deliver it to the router. Some key takeaways here is the daemon process is very lightweight, it is single-threaded, yet it can deliver up to 30,000 events per second. We spool only on failures, so the impact on resources is very low here, and the dependencies are very low. So customer did not uh, care about complex uh, uh, dependencies. Now, talking about the main platform, you can see like Router Gateway Prism, they have the same use case of consumption and delivery. So that way, we actually divided our subsystem into multiple reusable components. So uh, you will actually see these components repeated everywhere. We start with an HTTP server, which consumes data from the publisher host, and they are um, under a load balancer and a rate limiter for the whole data center, so that they get uniform distribution of traffic. They receive the data, they batch them, they compress them, and they send it to the second component, which is broker, via ZMQ. It also takes care of authentication and authorization of the host, so that a rogue host cannot simply deliver data to data highway. And broker, after receiving it, sends it to HTTP forwarder. HTTP forward is actually, um, it is on Apache HTTP components. It makes use of some asynchronous clients to deliver the data to gateways in different data centers. And just like an emitter, in case of failure, forwarder pauses receiving data, and broker spools it in the hard disk. And also for rolling deployment, the same thing happens. And once uh, the problems are resolved, broker despools, we deliver the data. Gateway, like I told you, the components are repeating here. Server takes it from router, forwarder delivers it to Prism, and we have a new component here called Grid Delivery Agent, or GDA, which gets a copy of the data from broker, batches them into Avro files, and delivers it to HDFS. Two major points I'll mention here. GDA, actually, when it aggregates the data, it does it in terms of event type and timestamp. So you can actually process the files the way you want. The second one is immutability of the data that we deliver to HDFS. So uh, there are multiple hosts under gateway delivering the files, right? So they actually deliver the files for the same tenant in a shared directory. And after some point of time, this re directory is renamed and moved. This makes it immutable. So when the client is processing this, they don't need to worry about new data arriving in the directory, and they can simply archive it. And Finally, the last component of the platform. So rest of the things are same here, but you have streaming delivery agent, which is an extension of the uh, forwarder. This takes care of delivery of data to Storm. Uh, it takes care of actually a couple of things here. One is the uh, host discovery. So the spouts register themselves under a uh, Storm registry, and SDA takes, uh, actually discovers the host using it. Also, it gets the SSL certificates for delivery. And we have Another component called Kafka Delivery Agent, which uses the Kafka producer library to deliver data to Kafka. And both of these actually can do the filtering of traffic, like I mentioned before. And the, finally, to wrap up the architecture, um, I'll talk about the metadata channel. This metadata channel is available across all the geolocations. So when publishers emit data, 
the count of events for a specific time range is logged into this metadata store via routers. And as event is making through the system, we actually log all the received and sent counts throughout the platform. So finally, when the customer is consuming this data, they can talk to a DH counter web service to find out how many, hosts, how many events were emitted and how many of them were delivered. So based on a high threshold, they get the confidence of whether to consume this data now or consume it later. Also, this helps us to triangulate any event loss that could be happening at any of the hops because we have the whole uh, transition of the events logged here. It also helps us to do some historical trending of data so we can decide like, for a specific tenant if there is any organic growth happening or we will need to allocate more hardware. So with all this information, uh, this black box becomes this, routers running in the publisher data centers, delivering data to multiple data centers, and gateways and prisms taking care of batch and uh, real-time delivery. So Heaving will talk about the challenges next. Okay, thanks. thanks. So uh, during the creation of the systems, we have encountered many challenges, and we learned a lot of lessons. In the following few minutes, I will share some of them, and hopefully they are useful. So in any communication systems, there are two important uh, metrics to consider. One is the throughput, the other one is SAI. As a platform, once the SAI is fixed, we want to maximize the throughput, make the max use of the hardware. So as Neelan presented, there are three subsystems, router gateway and the prism. And our performance tests show that this gateway actually is the bottleneck of the platform. So let's uh, go look at the more details of this. So in this gateway, actually, the grid delivery agent, or GDA, uh, contains two components. One called the file spooler. It creates the arrow files to the disk. The other one called the file uploader. It just picks the files and upload to the grid. So in the Sunday cases, the HEV server receives the batches and send to the broker. Broker either uh, based on whether it's a stream delivery agent or batch delivery. It sends to the forwarder or sends to the file spooler. Then file spooler, each thread will accept all the events for all the tracks and partition the data in the disk, create the arrow files. Also, it partition according to the schema version, uh, schema name, and uh, timestamp. Then the file uploader, all this, each thread will also pick all the files and send to the grid. So this is Sunday cases, but during the outage, say the grid is not available, or when the broker sends more data than the file spooler can accept, then the file, uh, broker will spool the data to the disk. And it's just append the event to the spool files. Then when the outage is resolved or problem solved, it tries to dis, uh, dispool the files and send to the file spooler. So from my uh, description, you probably already know that the problem is uh, disk contention. So multiple threads uh, try to find him for the uh, resources, trying to read or write to the files to the disk. So once we know the issue of the disk contention, the solution seems obvious. We split the disk into two. One just for the broker spool the data, and the other one is for the file spooler creating the Avro files. And also we replace the hard disk with the source disk drive for creating Avro files. Here we didn't replace the uh, for files uh, broker spool data because we need a large capacity to account for longer like uh, outage time, and it's not uh, cost effective to replace those with uh, SSD. And also our performance test uh, show that after split the disk, actually this uh, disk is uh, uh, good enough. So after we split the disk, actually the performance, uh, the throughput increases. But we find the other issue, like the namespace issue. We know that in the HDFS, it's best used for storing large-sized files in the grid. And, but for some customers, they have small events or small event rate. We create lots of small files, and the namespace uh, consumed very quickly for the customers. So we want to solve this issue. So one of the way we try to resolve this is uh, aggregate the events over time. For some customers, they, don't, uh, we, they can 
like deliver the events of uh, five minutes or 10 minutes. They don't need like one minute delivery. Or for some customers, they just want to uh, batch, uh, back up the data. They can even aggregate the events of uh, up to one hour. So this solves uh, the namespace issue for some customers. But some other customers, they cannot uh, aggregate the events over uh, like five minutes. They need uh, one minute files. Then one solution is just uh, merge the files during the uploading of the files to grid. So for each thread of, in the file uploader, it tries to pick the, the events, uh, every files for the same uh, topic, uh, schema version, and the timestamp. Then during the upload, uh, it merges the files. But the downside of this method is that it has to manipulate the error files. A better solution, we found that we probably should use the single thread writing principles. So we create a single thread, accept all the events from other threads, then writing files to the uh, disk. So this method uh, easily saves us like more than 10x uh, uh, namespace, since we have more than 10 threads in the system. Also, in the in this, uh, the advantage of this uh, method is that the file uploader doesn't have to manipulate the error files. It just uh, picks the error file and uploads it. So in a summary, uh, to improve the throughput, we try to improve the disk IR by separate the disks. We also replace the hard disk uh, with the source state drive for create error files. We also aggregate the files over time or of threads in the file spooler. So our performance test shows that after all those steps done, we have improved the throughput by like more than 2x in the uh, real production system. So all that is good. We improved the throughput. But as a platform, actually, we want to control the throughput and make the throughput increasing in a controllable fashion. As a recap, uh, there are different characteristics of our customers. On one extreme, the customers have a large event size and large event rate. On the other extreme, they have like small event size, small event rate. And to some, for some customers, they have very spiky uh, traffic. For example, here we list uh, a figures sampled from the real system. Besides the periodic uh, characteristic of the data, we can see there's a spiky traffic on top of that. Also, on the receiver side, sometimes the receiver is uh, external and shared on uh, third part uh, platforms. There are unbalance on the receivers. We want to resolve that. So as a platform, all the customers or tenants share the delivering capacity of the system. We don't want uh, any customers because of its uh, spiky traffic. It disturbs the other customers or tenants' uh, delivery of the system. So in order to do that, we have a distributed rate limit algorithm running on the routers. It checks on the fly whether the pre-planned capacity for the, each customer is consumed or not. If it's consumed, it just uh, uh, rejects the request and returns the uh, 429 to the emitters. So this uh, distributed rate limit algorithm solves the coupling issue uh, in the publisher side. So, uh, but sometimes this simple solution is not uh, cost e effective. Uh, why is this? Let's uh, look at this example. So the blue line is the uh, data and the red line shows the pre-planned capacities. Once in this simple algorithm, the customer sends uh, more than the pre-planned capacity, we reject that. But in the system, not all the customers will arrive at the peak rate at the same time. So sometimes there are still rooms in the node, in the host itself. If we reject that, it's not uh, cost uh, or if more hardware efficient. The other thing is that customer knows that once it's uh, breached the pre-planned capacity, the request will be rejected. So during the onboarding, they will try to account for this and adding like headrooms to the capacity. This with the more uh, hardware. So instead of reject this uh, request once it's breached uh, breach the pre-planned capacity immediately, we also checks 
the host's uh, capacity at some adapting street. So we check whether it's, uh, there are still room in the hosts. If there are still rooms that, we let the traffic go through and call it the tolerated traffic. So besides on the router, we also have uh, this uh, adaptive uh, rate limit on the gateway and the prison. That uh, solves the platform issues. But what about the external like platforms? So for the storm, actually we built a specialized uh, a data highway spout. It uh, uses, uh, checks the queue of the, uh, in the spout. If there is a, there is a like, lower threshold, once the queue size exceeds the lower threshold, it sends the 200, but specify a delay on the header of the response. And the sender will check the uh, headers and uh, account for the delay. But what if it exceeds all the queue, then it responds the 429 and reject the requests. So in a summary, in the receiver side, to provide some feedback to senders, we have two types. One is uh, uh, 429 to reject the requests, or 200 early feedbacks with uh, response uh, delay headers in the response. So this uh, is good, it solves the coupling issue in the publisher side. Occasionally we find that in the consumer side, we also have this uh, unbalanced receiver issue, especially in the prison to the storm, where you can find that the connections is not uh, balanced uh, among the receivers of the storm. So let's uh, look at that. So initially, we uh, use a uh, round robin algorithm to pick the receivers. So the PRISM, or SDA, the stream delivery agent, when it receives the data, it tries to pick the receiver using the round robin fashion. And in some cases, somehow the spout is slow because maybe it shares with some other customers. Then there are connections built up. That's where for each outstanding uh, events, there's a connection is established between the sender and the receiver. So if the connection is built up, then it slows down the uh, date rate. Then after some time, the sender will blacklist the receivers. Then this pattern goes over to the next slide, next uh, receiver. In a short time, this makes the uh, traffic throughput reduced uh, drastic, uh, drastically. So in order to resolve this issue, we actually uh, created this uh, penalty-based load balancer. This penalty is a metric that's a multiplication of the number of active uh, connections with the latency weight. So for the receivers, if the latency is similar, then this penalty is decided by the number of active connections. So this way, the penalty will control how many connections can be established from the sender to the receiver. So this uh, penalty-based load balancing makes the connections more uh, balanced among the receivers. Also, this actually decouples the customers in the sender side, because uh, we know that the open file descriptor is limited in the box. If uh, too much connections established from, for the one customer, the other customer will be impacted. So in this way, we limit the connection for each customer and makes them decoupled. So all is good. During the Sunday cases, the traffic uh, like runs smoothly. But during the like outage recovery cases, we find that in some cases there are traffic flood uh, situations. That's because uh, the broker spores the data and uh, creating more traffic to the receiver. So let's uh, look at more details here. So during the outage, as we know that the broker will spore the data to the disk, creating the spore files. Once the outage is resolved, uh, on top of the live data, there are extra data because of the broker dispore the data from the disk. And this actually creates a lots of uh, rejected requests and uh, waste lots of like uh, network resources. So in order to regulate this uh, extra traffics, 
in the center side, we create a component called rate controller. So actually, one of our uh, colleagues uh, borrowed this idea from the TCP IP, this uh, great algorithm called additive increase, multiplicative uh, decrease algorithm. So in this uh, rate controller, there are four components, two rate estimators. One is to estimate how many events are uh, uh, delivered successfully. The other one estimates how many events are slaughtered or rejected by the receiver. Then the third component called a rate limiter. It accumulates uh, tokens according to a rate that's calculated based on those two rate estimators. So in the real time, the forwarder try to, before send, it asks this uh, rate controller whether it can send or not. Then the rate controller checks if there is any tokens available or not. If there is a token available, it consumes uh, one token and uh, send the positive response. Then the forwarder will send the data to the receivers. After some time, there is a response uh, returned back. It could be 200 or 429. If it's a 200, okay, then controller will adjust the successful rate, then also update the rate limiter by adding the fixed amount. But if its uh, response is 429, it's slaughtered, then controller will update the slaughter rate and also adjust the token accumulate rate by multiply a ratio that's a successful uh, proportion of the uh, rates. So after applying this uh, rate controller, we find that during the outage recovery, it drastically reduces the 429 and makes the traffic more smooth. So in a summary, to control the throughput, in the platform, in the receiver side, we have this uh, adaptive rate limit to rate limit uh, the sending traffic. On the storm side, we have this append-based load balancer to balance the connections more evenly among the receivers. On the sender side, in the platform, we have this uh, AIMD-like rate controller to regulate the traffic sending from the senders. So we have uh, like more challenges like how to remove the event duplication by apply an algorithm of uh, receiver awareness. And we also have challenges how to like uh, make the service available even during the deployment and something like that. So I don't have time to go into details. If you are interested, we can talk offline. And that's all my presentation. Any, so questions? any questions from your side? Yes, yeah, so uh, in the platform side, actually, we find that the adaptive uh, rate limit is uh, like uh, gives the real feedbacks. It's uh, like enough. We don't have to like consider this earlier feedback. We don't need that actually. Yeah, that's so why we. The AMD based solution also takes care of that. So on the uh, in, inside the platform, actually, we have control on both sides, right? Publishers and consumers. So. Uh, we found like the AMD based solution gave us the better tick for a buck. So, <laughs> that's the what based solution? Sorry. Sorry. The what based? The AIMD uh, algorithm that he explained. The sender so, controller. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How often do you see failures on the uh, the data heavy cluster? Question mm. one. Okay, that's a and two. I, I maybe I missed it. How how much data flows through the system, say every day? Okay, so actually, uh, you might have missed that. So uh, on an average, we have nearly 800 terabytes of data uncompressed coming into the platform. And then we replicate this data, and when we deliver it to HDFS, or if the customers want, we can do it for the storm side also. We, for some destinations, we compress it. And for some destinations, we do uncompressed delivery. So together, it gives us nearly 1.2 to 1.3 petabytes every day on an average. Now, answering your second question, that is about failures. So, uh, yeah, so while uh, building data highway, we actually take, take, we took into account, right? So, uh, like, there will be very minor chances of failure and, and losing data, 
mainly in case of in-flight messages, if the process crashes, you lose this data, that kind of scenarios. Uh, but uh, so far we have been, uh, I mean, we have data highway running for us for like more than, more than three years now, yeah. but the number of failures has been very, very minimal. So uh, I think uh, considering the return of your inv investment, those losses were so minimal, so we have not invested on fixing that kind of scenarios. Yeah. So what is the latency? Uh, so see, that's what like uh, this latency, when you are saying latency, I believe you're talking about the source to endpoint latency, right? So it entirely depends on how long the failure will be. So my question is, uh, because we are trying to implement some real time data okay. transfer from the source, source to destination, mm -hmm. and, uh, and if, even if the tran I don't want to delay the transaction, because in between the transactions, we write the data to Okay. So if we want to use the, the this great uh, highway, and if we write it to the router, mm -hmm. the router is trying to write temperature all the way to the destination. But in case the destination is down, it is like going to pull it to the disk. Yes, correct. Right. So uh, how long would it take to write it to the disk or to send the data? So there, if there is no downtime, it's going to send it in sample. Yeah. Right. If there is downtime, it's going to write to the disk. So that's that latency. Okay, so the disk latency is actually fairly minimal. And see, the thing is like, in this case, your bottleneck is the network or the endpoint not being available. Right. So writing this disk, actually we consider, consider this into a hardware location. So um, it, writing to this, the latency will be entirely dependent on the hard disk or the underlying file system that you're using, right? So, uh, but if you consider data being delivered to the destination after the failure is resolved, so in this case, the endpoint will be receiving a combination of late data and real data together. Live data will continue to flow through the system. On top of that, he will be the destination will be receiving the spool traffic at the same time. Now, in case of HDFS, that probably will not be a problem because the files will be separated by timestamp. So in this case, depending on the need, you can simply skip the older files or you can process them as a separate batch job. Uh, for uh, real time, uh, actually we have a feature, we have not enabled it because uh, there is no requirement or use case at this point, but we can actually filter the older timestamps also. So depending on the need, you can actually decide like, hey, these are old data and my acceptance threshold is, threshold is already over. So I don't want data which is older than like 10 seconds or 15 seconds, and you can, can stop consumption of those data whereas the live traffic is, will continue to flow. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. And if it's uh, like in the mid-end failures, it disperses immediately. It does not uh, wait for. Yeah. yeah. In that case, spooling and dispooling will be happening in a fraction of a second. Yes, it, it seems that uh, in your architecture, there's no right hand log. So I think uh, it's client's responsibility to do the retry if what if, like, if that, the message is fair, is that true? Um, it will try to uh, resend. Actually, when it resends, it's not necessarily uh, sent to the same receiver. So we have uh, a bunch of uh, nodes uh, yeah. uh, listed on the uh, same like, C names. So, so the client need to uh, d uh, get the, the fair, fair, fair return code? And the client will responsible, be responsible for the uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it, it depends on the storm side or on the in the platform, right? So in both cases, we maintain the list of uh, consumers for the same destination, and we blacklist whatever is giving us failures. So that takes care of uh, removing that wrong host. Uh, so so the client, if the client don't do retry, uh, the, the Message deliver semantic will be at most once. Is that correct? Um, can I say that again? Okay. Maybe. Uh, I mean, if client don't do the retry, the message uh, for streaming case, hmm. the message deliver semantic will be at most once. Right here, we actually retry. We have a queue in uh, in the system. So when it's failures, it actually uh, queue the the data unless it's uh, response successful. Okay. We 
I actually yeah. understood your point. There's a problem with duplication of data, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, let's take it offline because uh, uh, we might be running out of time, but I thought you had one more question, right? I was just going to ask, uh, if you could speak about the nature of data that you feed to this system, like internal metrics, external tracking data, what type of things? All. So, uh, the data use cases, I can give you, I can't give you specific examples, but they will be like server logs, system logs, monitoring information, analytical data, audience data, anything. So all, all sorts of data. Okay, I think that's all. So uh, thanks a lot for attending the talk. Thank you. Thanks.